All right, welcome back to the second edition of the Late Night Loopcast. Josh and I stayed up. Uh, we're giving instant reactions on what just happened, the Republican debate, the second Republican debate, and Trump speaking at the United Auto Workers strike. If you want to help us out for this extra effort, send us a review, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, like, subscribe on YouTube. We appreciate it. Josh, I know you have a lot to say. What's going on in your mind? Well, I mean, you know, there's a few funny lines, um, you know, I, I think... For example, Chris Christie calling Donald Trump Donald Duck for not going to the debates sounded probably more clever on paper when whoever was his aides that came up with him. That joke kind of, it fell a little flat, uh, but his hope is that it would have been a great viral moment that would have been repeated again and again. Um, boy, Mike Pence, man, you do not have a career as, as a stand-up comedian. Like his cringe joke, I don't even want to repeat it. Like, brother, come on. I mean... I, I, you know, some people say I can take, I, I can, I can cut a few jokes here and there and it made people laugh. If you don't, just don't try, you know? I mean, it was so awkward. Like, yeah, it's like, you don't have to force it. Yeah. Man. I mean, Mike Pence doing that, it was like Al Gore's super Mr. Romance kiss at the 2000 convention. It was so awkward. It was like cringe oh. now. But overall, you know, there are portions of the, this debate that just, again, descended into a food fight. Because you have microphones of all seven or eight or 10, how many, 15 candidates, whatever. They all have their microphones on and everyone has an incentive to interrupt so that they can hopefully get in there and get in it word edgewise. Because my biggest complaint with this debate format, it's for cable news. It's meant to have these gotcha questions, 30 second, 60 second answers that can be caught up in and used real quick in news segments for the next day or two. It's not really meant to explain or understand better what these candidates stand for on the issues. And that's why at the end of the debate, Dana Perino wanted to get a little reality TV on us and said, who would you cut on the debate? And a bunch of people started writing down on their, on their notebooks, note, notepads, well, who they're going to they vote off the island. And I was so thankful that Ron DeSantis obviously listens to the Loopcast because I have been blasting these gotcha things and these goofy games and uh he said no you know i respect the other candidates here and i respect the voters more to try to play a gimmicky game like that so it was nice to see him say that i was very happy that someone wasn't he playing a, ball with you know that. he he had a few moments i think that it almost like the lights i feel like are slowly going on in his head that these moderators and formats are not for the best interest of Republicans and voters, like right. the questions that they're asking, questions about how crime affects LGBT inner city youth doesn't really seem like that the was most bizarre. obvious question for a Republican primary audience. Univision, I mean, we go go crazy. Go into that really quick because it was it was leveled at Mike Pence, and he gave it more credence than it. He should have. We, Ron DeSantis this is a few times throughout the night, but like that's a stupid question, and it's just straight from the other side's playbook. Why are we? Why are the questions being set? Sorry. No, I mean, it's, again, it's, like, it's, I... it's almost like a question of like, the, the question itself is setting the agenda. It's, 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 right. it, it's not like, hey, inner city, a crime in the inner city is a massive problem. Look at what's going on in, you know, Milwaukee, Detroit, Chicago, New York City. But they can't ask that question because then it would reflect poorly on President Biden and, and Democrats who run these big cities. So she's got <laughs> right. to make it, right. how can I make this an attack question against Republicans? Like, Hey, wait a minute! This inner city crime. How does it affect LGBT, LGBT youth? It's like, again, don't take the bait. And in fact, don't ever go on a debate stage with Univision. I mean, give me a break. This is a far left uh, wing news media outlet, you know. So uh, it's not like, Did oh, you, you don't see... care about Hispanic voters. I mean, we do care about Hispanic voters. We have outreach to Hispanic yeah, voters. Um... We have El Lazo, which is our Spanish counterpart. We want to win. Uh, Hispanic Catholic voters over to the cause of the pro pro family pro life, but Univision is a far left wing uh, media outlet affiliated with NBC, and it, they are just a bunch oh, of journalistic yeah. hacks, and no Republican. Right. Why? Why would the Republican National Committee allow Univision to be a part of this? It's a joke. Yeah, and uh, it's funny too because there's that example in Philadelphia on Tuesday where there was just a complete raid of an Apple store and everyone took everything out of that store. They're live streaming it. They're so brazen that people are live streaming this on 
to people's phones and then Apple set off all the alarms. And so they're just smashing them, pouring orange juice on them, laughing like it's all just now, a good you time. mentioned I mean, that. that that's what people are really scared about. That's what about, people are. Yes, that's what actual citizens are concerned about. But then you get these candidates on the stage who are like, well, actually, you know, North Dakota is above average on, on ACT scores. And you're like, what world are you living in? And all these people, I served on committees and I, you know, guys, snap out of it. Like, you get so many guys, they're just like drones. They're just like, I'm going to give you another important right. statistic about why I think. Guys, this is not 2004. I keep saying this. Wake up. Like, the country's on fire. There's a lot of problems going on right now in our country, and you're just, like, giving these, like, long senatorial speeches. Like, come on. Like, do you want to lead this country? I wish someone would have... I think if I, I would have given a ton of points to someone if they would have taken a dumb question like that, said, hey, this happened in Philadelphia on Tuesday. You know the quickest way to get this to stop? Throw them in jail put a big sentence on them, get rid of the DAs, or, you know, solved. bring back solved. We do this caning all over the or flogging or something like that. So, I mean, I, right, I like, mean that. Like, honestly, that, like, corporal punishment on these guys. Seriously, there's such an easy way to solve this, and yet every soft on crime big city doesn't do it right now. I would want a president to go in and well, say, I don't even hey, think it's locking crime. everyone up in ball for 10 years. I don't think it's even that they're soft on crime or, we. you know, I think that these big city mayors are perfectly happy with crime because- they, you know, they don't care about their citizens. Like it, 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 they want chaos in the society. Like some people just want to watch the city burn, and you think it's just the Joker, and when you realize it's the guy in 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 the mayor's mansion. That's where it gets really crazy. That was a sick, sick Joker reference. But all this kind of beside, because I, if you were to combine the percentage uh, in polls of all the people on the stage, they'd still be down to Donald Trump by twenty percent. And yes, people right. took their cute shots at him, saying Donald Duck. You should be here. Honestly, it all kind of came across. Okay, as so all that to stuff would be the tone. All that that corrects me up. Okay. But let's. Well, actually, though, the, could the, the dig on Trump, right? Like, why isn't he here? You know, they did a little bit here and there of that, um, but it's still not enough. Like, if you want, I mean, the, he skipped the first debate and now the second debate because he felt like he wasn't going to get punished by the voters for it, right? So, if you're a competitor yeah. to Trump, you need to make him pay for it. You need to make him pay an electoral price. You need to make him hit, take a hit in the polls. And so far, he hasn't done it. And my point is that all these, like, oh, kind of whining that he's not at the debate. You should be much more louder about it. You should make it every other sentence that you're saying it so it really digs in. And you should have been saying this a month ago. So, like, there's a super PAC called Never Back Down that's totally pro-DeSantis, right? And they put out this ad well, it saying- is. It's a super PAC. Yeah, it's a super PAC. They put out this ad saying, oh, Trump, why aren't you at the debate? Are you chicken or whatever? And I thought it was actually not that bad of an ad. It was pretty good. I said, well, where was this like a month ago? Like, that's what you should have been saying then. Guess what? The guys would never back down. They responded to me. And they're like, um, well, actually, and they did release <laughs> it a month ago. And I thought to myself, wait a minute now. I Cell work phone. in politics. I actually really, really <laughs> like Ron DeSantis, and I still don't know about this ad. Like, that shows you how little effort they put into making this message get out there. Like, I'm hyper-involved. Yeah. I'm reading this stuff and watching this stuff all the time. And if I didn't hear about this, then you think the people in Iowa or New Hampshire did? That's what I'm saying. Like, these campaigns, sometimes these campaigns, they believe their own press releases they everything they think the sun sets and rises on everything that they do. You're not breaking through the average American voter. You got to get your message out there. You got to see it. Uh, you know, every day of the week and twice on Sunday, you got to hammer home your points because otherwise, people aren't going to understand it. They're not going to listen to you like, well, let me tell you about the statistic and ten percent and da da da. I mean, so much of this debate was so boring. That's why right. people look over. Oh gosh. Donald Trump's in Detroit, and he's talking to guys who work in unions. And you're thinking to yourself, yeah, you know, actually, to win the White House, Republicans need voters like that. The last time we did that was Donald Trump. He won voters like that in 2016. He won Michigan by the tiniest of a percentage point. I knew, I mean, I grew up in the Detroit area. I knew people that went to those rallies, and they were humongous. And so before I get into his, because I actually thought it was much more interesting than the debate, but I actually disagree with you on the 
hammering it home. I think every time someone brings up him not being there and voters deserving more or whatever is corny. I think it came across as super whiny. Well, I think even if they would have done it before, it's kind of whiny. Here, um, let me finish my if, take. If it's, I agree with let you. If it's take. done whiny, it's terrible, which is what it was tonight. Which is what it was done. How, so here, how, here's do, you do, it, how do you do it, Tom? I, so it's not that I actually don't think you do it. Uh, I think Trump smartly, Trump smartly recognized to avoid these debates completely because look what happened. If DeSantis or Vivek would have uh, created their own buzz by going to places. So, for example, what if DeSantis would have gone and visited the political prisoners uh, that were are taken by the FACE Act right now? And he went and he did media, met with them personally, talked about what he would do if he was president. Th this would be done. What if someone would have gone to the picket line before Trump did yeah. and met with people right. and talked about... So well, Trump, that was real Trump, Trump is a man of action. That's why him going to the picket line was so Correct. smart. Like that's what people don't understand. And that's why people are going to vote. I've for said him. this before. So none of these Ron people DeSantis, are about that light. Like Ron DeSantis is like, I got to become governor of Iowa. I got to win every Iowa guy because then if I win Iowa, then I have a chance to like leapfrog and restart the debate and actually have a chance at the. And I get it, but I just feel like flipping pancakes in Iowa is like the way to win the election in 1988. That this is the internet era. You got to be better about this. Now, I agree with you that complaining and whining about the, him not being at the debate is totally lame. You can't do it. However, if you make Donald Trump, who's got this bravado, like he's a tough leader, if you make him seem like he's a wimp or a scaredy cat, you know, or a wussy, then you've got a chance. Like you've got to paint it that way. Like ah, he's afraid to take us on because. He knows he can't handle, you know, whatever. And that's hard to do because he's at 50 some percent in the polls. Like, it, you know, it's, I don't know. Ga I mean, so, Governor Gavin the, Newsom the is the Democratic governor of California. He's obviously a hard leftist and he's trolling Republicans. But he made the point that this isn't even a debate. This As is he like, should. He's like, this is the XFL. He said, this is like the JV. Or the JV. It's not even good enough to be a VP debate. I mean, it's nothing. And, of course, he's saying that just because he wants to get his insults in. But, I mean, he's not wrong. No, he's not wrong. And, and you've made this point before. I was so disappointed with the questions that were asked, the quality of the moderators, the mudslinging that was happening. I think that if these candidates were smart, they would also avoid this wholesale and go and actually go to the places where issues would matter. So like imagine questions that I wished were asked. So for example, what would you do about the Department of Justice persecuting Catholics? Them actually going to a persecuted Catholic, talking, creating media around that, making promises. Bang, there's one. The United Auto Workers, go to the picket line, create that buzz. So those are questions that I actually, there needs to be action on. And these candidates really have not shown that they're really about action at all. I know, but they're, they're back on past issues. I mean, it'd be great so, if we but, had but some of these Trump alternative though. forums like um, Rumble, you know, with the with their video out. Uh, they're the alternative to YouTube. So if like Rumble came up and said, what if we did a debate and we had some writers from, you know, The Blaze or Breitbart or Daily Wire and we did our own debate and you invite, you know, can, the candidates, but you say, we're not going to do this like in a cable news 40 second clips. We're going to give the, you know, each speak, speaker like three minutes to answer it at least so that they can actually give substantive answers. They can talk. And then there would be an opportunity to actually have a cross debate. Like that'd be interesting. Like I would actually be interested in hearing, you know, Vivek, Vivek and, um, you know, Nikki Haley. Nikki Haley loves war, and and, he, and Vivek is not so big on it. And so, like, if the two of them, instead of screaming at each other for 30 seconds, if they actually had a longer, substantive debate about, you know, Nikki could say it's really important for Americans to subjugate themselves for Ukraine and Israel and because America doesn't matter. Like, go for it. Like, make your arguments, you know? Yeah. And, like, everyone else could be like, I'm sorry, wait, what? Like, why were you our ambassador to the United Nations if you hate our own country so much? It would be great to have this kind of debate, but we don't get into that with these 30 second sound bites. Um, and I also I don't want to give you too much of an opportunity to dunk here, but Nikki Haley, I she came across as so just 
like the whole girl boss, like the, I'm dumber for having listened to you. It just doesn't come off well for her. Well, and that's actually hard the for only her to do. That, so to give me, her credit. Like she really right. It's it's a it's a tough needle to thread for sure. But the only person that was on the stage that I felt like could actually do a full podcast, and he has, is Vivek. Yeah, I think it's Vivek, well, and I, no, no, I got I yelled at that. last time for not pronouncing it correctly. Vivek. I don't agree He's with the him only on a person lot of stuff, that can speak. but I think he gives good exactly, answers. Exactly, but yeah. Correct, but he's not a robot. He's the only person on that stage that's not a robot. And, and not that's, everyone, and that's no, no not offense the only to- one, but just true. Mike Pence especially. Like Mike Pence- I would say- he, He's so Christy, robotic, but he's, he's like, I gotta come up with the sex joke to make it sound like I'm not- I mean, Come on, bro. It's just so dumb. Okay, but all this is like, this is mudslinging. Like, my final thoughts, dumb- it was dumb that they did it through Fox and how it was moderated. It wasn't productive. I don't think we learned anything more than we did before. Nothing new came out of this. It just made people look dumb. Uh, Trump at the UAW picket line. Uh, you want to talk about a guy who, A, gets it, and then B, has real support. I mean, the videos I saw of how many people were there were unbelievable. And Biden tried his best, but it was a very small turnout for when he went to the picket line. And, and because he can also barely string two sentences together. I mean, it's, it's turning into elder abuse at this point. Uh, Biden did a, a video recently that they posted on Twitter, and there was like 80 different cuts. Like, it, they literally that. put together 80 little video clips. They to had make two it. cameras. Yeah. They had two cameras, like, and they kept having to switch guy between can't the video feeds. recite a whole paragraph without having to do 100 cuts on it. I mean, it's just terrible. It's really shameful in this position. But anyway, Trump gets to the picket line, and he says, uh, <laughs> I got to find the exact quote because this is so good. No, he said, um, he said, under a Trump administration, gasoline engines will be allowed, but sex changes the, for children will be banned. I mean, okay, so, so good. here's the thing is we give Trump a lot of grief when he gets a little crazy. So the other day when I think it was Dana Perino asked him like, hey, uh, what do you, th or no, it wasn't Dana. It was um, the other Fox girl who's not there anymore. Um Who's got her podcast this morning? See, it's late Megan night. And we're getting tired, but Megan, Megan Kelly, Megan Kelly, very sharp woman. She asked Donald Trump, "You know, can a man become a woman?" And and Donald Trump's answer was, "Uh, uh." He just didn't really. He didn't. He, he didn't know how to answer it. Like and it was funny. So then, like a, a few days later, someone asked Ron DeSantis. He goes, "Oh, that's an easy question." No, obviously. <laughs> um, and so we give, you know, we we we. We tell Trump, like, and then Trump was blaming, you know, the election defeats of 2022 on pro-lifers. And we're like, dude, what are you talking about? So, like, this idea that I'm a Trump simp, I love that. Like, no, we, we give the guy, and we'll, we'll praise and attack depending on how Trump these guys simp. stand on the issues. You know what I'm saying? So, but the thing that usually happens with Trump is he says something stupid and the conservatives say, dude, what are you talking about? Like, that, you got that wrong. And he'll never admit he got it wrong, but like three or four days later, he resurfaces and he says something better than any of the other candidates on our side would say. So exactly. Like, so he's going to the UAW guys and he's like, um, I, I, you know, you should, you're, you're asking for one. Well, the problem is we have inflation and that's why you don't have as much money and all these mandates on electronic vehicles. And he goes, and by the way, under a Trump administration, gasoline engines will be allowed. But sex changes in children will not. Like, it's just so good. <laughs> he gets it, man. He's there shaking hands. There's people in line. He, even his speech was... So the electric vehicles are a big part of this uh, strike. And they're, the average auto worker is very concerned about this because... Yeah, because it's expensive so, these, to buy. These factories can get sent. They're expensive to buy, and the factories can get sent overseas. And they will. And, and Trump, rightfully so, is coming, hey... Your, your concerns are well-founded. Uh, Biden gave his best, tried his best to come out here and well, talk to you, I guess. A lot of these auto workers, they like to go up north and they like to hunt and they know it gets cold up in northern Michigan. There's places in the country, and no one wants an electronic battery where I'm at, where it's cold. It's like, I'm not going to trust some battery. Like, give me a break. I want gasoline. <laughs> and you know what? A gasoline engine is better because I don't even like the OnStar like, like, no, I don't want anyone to be able to turn my car off remotely. Well, you could do that with an electronic yeah. vehicle, all this stuff. I mean, what happened to independence? No way. Uh -uh. And electronic vehicles, I mean, like, you know, it, you need a new battery and it's like, what, $10,000 or something like that? Like, nah, no well, thanks. Where's, where's the battery coming out from? What materials right. are made of? How do you charge it? 
gas prices gas prices right now too brutal i mean no oh. he, he's a trump trump is he gets it man that's what i'm like that's why i'm saying these other candidates need to start while donald trump was very smart to make sure that while the debate was going on he had effective and more interesting counter programming so the first debate he's like i'll do an interview with tucker boom that went wild and now they're doing a second debate he's like i'll just go talk to the auto workers on strike in detroit okay <laughs> michigan he won it in 2016 he didn't win in 2020 but again you know, he's a candidate. It's like, these are the kind of voters we need to win. And he was out there and he's, you know, yucking it up. So it was very smart political. Um, I, you know, that was a clever political movement maneuver by Trump. And you know what? None of those candidates on the stage are going to make him pay for it. I don't think they're going to see a dip in the poll. I don't think Trump's going to be see a dip in the polls because of that. No, I just don't. These other candidates don't are running out of time. I mean, you know, we're, you know, a lot of things can change okay, in so December, but. projections. Projections at this point in time, we just watched the debate. We just watched the Trump speech. What are your projections? I mean, I still don't see any massive change. I don't see that many people, um, you know, really second guessing their their decision making on this. Um, I mean, obviously, as we get closer, you know, when you're talking about four weeks before the Iowa caucuses, then then people are like, okay, now I got to get serious, and then we'll see if there's any change or movement. But, um, you know. There really hasn't been, you know, any change in the last month. If anything, it's, you know, Trump's position got a little bit stronger. So uh, that's what it was like since the last debate. So I don't, I, I just don't see any breakthrough moment here. And that's not, again, I want to make sure people who are listening understand it. I'm not even saying what I want or what I suggest. I'm just trying to be honest about this. Like there no, was no breakthrough that's, that's moment. What the show is. There was nothing I saw out of here where people, I, I can't imagine people like, wow. Now I see that this, this other candidate is the candidate for me. I mean, maybe, well, we'll see. I could be wrong, but I don't know. Didn't seem that yep. interesting. A lot of, a big food fight. Yeah. Let us, let us know what you think. Uh, Lucas at CatholicVote.org if you want to talk to me. Uh, also, once again, help us out, leave some reviews. Uh, but we're going to time warp here. I'm going to go to bed, but uh, you'll see me in the next couple seconds. <laughs> Bye, guys. Okay, we just did some time travel there. Late night, Tom and Josh just ripped off the best takes you've ever heard about a debate. And so now we move into our next section. This one was, I don't even know where to start with it. Uh, it has to do with gold bards and Egyptians. And that's like the absolute tip of the iceberg. So fortunately, we have our resident researcher, Erica, who went on all the charges against Senator Menendez uh, for potential bribery and corruption he was indicted on. Erica, what are we looking at with Senator Bob Menendez? All right. Senator Bob Menendez is the senior senator from, is that how you say it, Josh? Senior senator from New Jersey. And yes, he has been indicted on multiple counts. And reading the indictment was just, I mean, it's its just out of a Jack Ryan novel. It's ridiculous. So the, the indictment itself, it's his second time around. Back in 2017, he faced charges as well. They didn't stick. These are much more specific. And particularly, he is indicted for a, quote, corrupt relationship with three New Jersey businessmen. Uh, he and both, and he is uh, 69 years old, and his wife, Nadine, who he's been married uh, to for three years now, they accepted hundreds of thousands of dollars in bribes in exchange for using his power and influence as the head of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, which is a very powerful position, uh, to seek, to protect, and enrich. These three men, Hana, Daivis, and Urbe, and to benefit the Arab Republic of Egypt. Now, why Egypt? One of the three men in the indict named in the indictment is Wael Hana, who's an Egyptian American businessman. And in exchange for Menendez's pledge to facilitate uh, military sales and financing for the Arab government in Egypt, Hana promised to give the senator's wife, Nadine, who is a good longstanding friend of his, apparently, a no-show job. So he's going to pay her to do nothing. And other <laughs> No-show gifts. job is a sick word. I know, right? <laughs> that is the best way to describe getting bribed, a no-show job. It's a Gen Z awesome. dream. I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, so, continue. I was just you guys. So Nadine and Hannah, this goes back to, like I said, before Nadine even started dating Bob back in 2018. I just I can't even read this with a straight face. Okay, so she had worked and she worked over those two years before they got married 
with Hana to introduce multiple Egyptian intelligence and military officials to Senator Menendez. Um, and he provided sensitive, non-public, according to the charges, he provided sensitive, non-public U.S. government information to Egyptian officials and otherwise took steps to secretly aid the government of Egypt. Um, for example, he gave them information regarding the number and nationality of persons serving at the U.S. Embassy in Cairo, Egypt. And not while cool. In, not cool. Like, I mean, Benghazi, hello. They, <laughs> like, we've been here. But the information was not classified, which um, Menendez's lawyer, which I'll get to in a second, is leaning into. But it was highly sensitive and could pose significant operational security concerns if disclosed. Um, he also, Menendez, it continues, I just, I keep going. He used his influence to break up two criminal investigations of the other two businessmen who are named in the indictment. And when the search warrant was executed, investigators found over $480,000 in cash, much of it stuffed into envelopes and hidden in clothing closets and a safe, along with multiple gold bars that had been hidden in various orifices throughout the house. Um, Menendez, of course, comes out with a defense. He says... Wait, doesn't ever... I thought everyone does that. It, you guys don't have gold bars hidden around different places in your All right, so here's, here's why he said he does that. He says he's been doing that for years because he's of Cuban-American... He's of Cuban heritage. And so as a Cuban, as a, uh, an inheritor of the Castro regime... He's worried that the New Jersey government is going to come knocking at his door and take all his assets, which doesn't speak very highly for New Jersey. <laughs> doesn't he represent New Jersey? I right. think so. Are you so. doing a bad enough job to let it all come crashing down? My you guy? know, if, yeah. I get gold, if I get gold bars from foreign governments, I make sure not to Google how much cash value is a gold bar worth. <laughs> this was also in the indictment, his Google searches. How much is a gold Googled bar it. worth? Yeah. We which, also I had, mean, you know. Yeah. The specific congressman, stuff. This is why I thought Con duck, duck, go next time. Florida Congressman Matt Gates went to the House floor and said, We are devaluing American money so rapidly that in America today, you can't even bribe Democratic senators with cash alone. You need to bring gold <laughs> bars to get the job done, so just so that the bribes hold value. Well, gold bars really? and a brand new Mercedes Benz convertible and mortgage payments on your home, which are other oh, heck yeah. rewards that Nadine received. Um, the evidence in the indictment named, it's just so, they weren't even trying to conceal this. I mean, we have text messages for between Nadine and uh, the businessmen saying things like, are you happy? Like with your Mercedes convertible. And she's like, I've never been so happy in my life. And like, <laughs> it's just. Guys, we, we need to start the Egyptian loop cast. The what are we doing? We could, have, we could all have lenses. The we could crescent have cast. Bars. Right. You know, it's just like. What a, can yeah, we do geez, for them? Way right, why not, right? Why are we sticking to America? But if we could just wrap it in a bow, there were fingerprints on the money, right? Fingerprints on yeah. the money, fingerprint on the bars of the people that they're dealing with. Like, this is the most smoking gun. Uh, red-handed. God, red-handed. Red I mean, it's totally red-handed. It's very yeah. concrete infer like evidence that is presented here. And uh, it's so obvious that top Democrats have come out across the board with a few notable exceptions including the White House and Chuck Schumer. Well, White House is and, like, ah, blah, 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 blah. But Oh, the Senate you, will take care of it. Mm. Right. But mm. Dem uh, Pennsylvania Democrat John Fetterman called for his resignation. AOC, you know, the left-wing nut job from Brooklyn, called for him to resign. And it might start picking up as more and more Americans find out about this information. Andy Kim is a congressman from New Jersey. He's like, hey, I'm, go I'm going for it. I'm going to run for Senate now. I'm going to run for this seat because, you know, I'm going to get my name out there because when the governor needs to appoint someone, once this guy finally re resigns, and maybe he'll pick me. And the thing is about this is that because the Democrat, the governor of New Jersey is a Democrat and Murphy barely won last race. I mean, it was like a razor thin. But so since the seat is will stay, if he does resign, the Democratic governor will appoint a Democrat to fill the seat. So Democrats like, I could look like a mythical by calling for this guy to resign. Uh, but here's the funny thing about this. This totally reminds me of uh, Al Capone because they never got Al Capone on his actual crimes, right? They got him for tax evasion. They could never get him for killing people, ordering the hits on all these people, all this, you know, uh, trafficking of illegal substances and all this stuff. No, they got him for tax evasion, right? Well, Bob Menendez is pretty obvious that he was involved with Jeffrey Epstein. 
and he went to the island and he did unspeakable things. I'm not going to explain, which you can Google, but you can guess what I'm getting at. And th there wasn't enough to get him on this. So now he's going to, you know, like if, if a man is so morally corrupt, he's using Jeffrey Epstein. Chances are he's also ethically and business um, immoral, too. So the fact that he'd be taking bribes from the Egyptian government, not a shock. Shocker. Right. No, it's rare to have someone who's only vicious in one particular sin. <laughs> like, and I can't let it go unsaid. It. I can't let mm -hmm. it go unsaid. Bob Menendez, who, you know, pretends to be a Catholic, Jesuit educated, went to St. Peter's University. He held up the nomination of my close friend, Joe Sella, who was going, he was a, my co-founder here at Catholic Vote. He was up to be ambassador of Fiji. And Menendez held that nomination up for months and months and months until finally there was an agreement in the Senate and he couldn't hold on anymore. Uh, and the reason he held it up was that he was concerned that, you know, you're with this pro-family organization and, and how would you treat LGBT diplomats? And it's like, wait, I believe that marriage is between a man and a woman. I'm Catholic. Aren't you Catholic? But of course, my friend was wise enough not to say those kind of things and to upset the, you know, the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee. He answered the question truthfully and kindly and that's why someone like me is never probably going to go before the Senate to be confirmed, because <laughs> I don't think I can hold my tongue when someone like Bob Menendez is blowing smoke and just he's so full <laughs> of gas. The guy is. I think Erica is probably the only one who could hold Erica my might tongue. Be able, the only right. one to be able to get office. I think Josh and I have a, a cemented <laughs> our non-ability. I, yeah. I think that ship office. has sailed for me as well. <laughs> given yeah, a probably, few probably. I do. I do have a, a slack hack. Um, uh, internally here, we had someone write in our brainstorm channel, hey, at FBI, I heard Jeffrey Epstein's clients go to the Latin Mass. So in case we want to really go after hard all of the Latin Mass or all of the Epstein people, which we still haven't, um, maybe that's a good suggestion. That you're saying, in other words, that was a joke that the only way the it's FBI is going to actually investigate Epstein is if you say jokingly said, oh, yeah, Latin Mass. Then maybe Correct. that would get their attention. So I want to make sure people, mm -hmm. the, the joke lands for people, <laughs> it was a, obviously. It was a joke, right? <laughs> Tongue in the cheek here, people. Can you get a bunch of emails? <laughs> yeah, explaining jokes always goes over super well. Um, well, if you, joke, but, if you tell the uh, joke properly, you don't have to explain it. That's the problem. <laughs> I'd get out of here, Josh. <laughs> but, uh, Josh, I would like your expertise. So one thing that I've found pretty interesting about the Menendez story is that there, that President Biden has basically said, well, I'm going to let the Senate handle that. It hasn't really given us two cents. A lot of major figures have not said anything uh, in some people have actually come to his defense slightly by their silence. People that come to mind would be like Senator Cory Booker. Um, of course, Fetterman, AOC, they're kind of known to really shoot from the hip and uh, sling it out. But even Chuck Schumer hasn't really made a decision at this point what he's going to do about it. With such obvious corruption, why, why have there not been other people, major people in the party saying, hey, you should resign? Is there like a... a strategy consequence for the Senate Democrats if they would have them design, resign? Well, I mean, it used to be we had a standard in our politics about 30 or 40 years ago that you would actually make the determination of whether or not to stay in office based on actually what you did. You know, like in other words, you know, it, it, there was a sense of honor and shame and like, oh, you got caught red handed doing something despicable. You should be you should leave office. Um, you know, that was like the Nixon standard. Right. Nixon did something shameful. He spied on his political opponents. He tried to, you know, he also did something where he assassinated the character of his uh, potentially biggest rival Muskie. He did all these things. OK. And it was like, you need to resign. Like, obviously, you did all these things to try to make sure that you get reelected and it's, it's, it's shameful. So he resigns. Well, uh, Bill Clinton comes around and he did a lot of shameful things, including lying under oath uh, to, to say nothing about the activities he did inside the Oval Office. And he just, just like decides, I'll write it out. Like it's going to actually be this tough to remove a president from power. So I'll just stay put. And I'll deal with the mudslide. I'll deal with all this slinging and all that stuff. And I'll pretend like it's a campaign. I'll say, oh, these guys are out to get me. And instead of just having the shame, because Bill Clinton's a man you can't shame. And so that, that was a new standard in politics for people like, wait a minute, I could just kind of wait it out. And after a while, there's a sort of short attention span. Like, how long can you sustain shame against somebody if they're just, just going to try to wait it out? So Menendez is probably thinking to himself, I'll do this. And look, I'm not going to be 
try to pretend like Trump wouldn't do the same thing. Trump is exactly the kind of person who'd be like, I'll just wait it out. So we have a new era of politics. And for a long time, Republicans were like, hey, we need to stay to this higher ethical standard, even if the Democrats have gone crazy. But then the problem is, like, they've just become so corrupted and so nasty that it's asymmetrical warfare. And so people are like, well, wait a minute now. We can't have a, a system, two, a two-tier system of ethics and shame where if, if, you know, if, you know, if we're going to go back to like what it was, Nixon did something wrong, he should resign. If we're going to go back to that standard, then we need to say Bill Clinton should have resigned, Bob Menendez should resign, Joe Biden should resign, you know, Donald Trump maybe should have resigned as well, and then start getting people who are a lot more ethical. But it's like, it's going to be really hard to try to say, no, 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 here's how it goes. The media is going to tar and feather somebody on the Republican side if he does something unethical. But if the Democrats do it, then we get a free pass. That's not a way to have a free society. It's not going to work. Right. And I think it's yeah. interesting to watch the mainstream media coverage of this. Um, obviously, the guys like at the Daily Wire and even on Fox News, they're totally, you know, very condemnatory of what Menendez, the indictment reads. Um, but in the mainstream, it's more treated as this like question, like, hmm, there's an investigation. It's kind of like Hunter Biden, like, wow, there's this investigation and there might be some wrongdoing here. And it's just they, it's so asymmetrical. Or like some you said. in the media have tied it to Clarence Thomas. And it's like, well, right. wait a minute now. It, it, and they say, <laughs> right. hey, if Bob Menendez was not at should Epstein's resign. Island, like, let's just put that right. out there. <laughs> Why? Then, if Menendez has to resign, then shouldn't Clarence Thomas, like, did Clarence Thomas get gold bars from the Egyptian government? Am I missing mm -hmm. something here? Like, uh, no. <laughs> like, he took a trip, yeah. you know, on a, on a millionaire's or billionaire's plane, just like every right. other senator does. Give me a break. He didn't right, take but... gold bars from the Egyptian government. Yeah. And I'd like to get your take on that. I was actually kind of reading around trying to trying to think about the future here when you talk about riding it out, Josh, that will this have an effect on the 2024? So like, is it is it early enough in the presidential race that by the time we get to October next year, and it's really coming down to the wire for, you know, I guess it's going to be Biden v. Trump probably, unless a miracle happens. Um, is Is it early enough that everyone will have forgotten by then and they will have ridden out the storm, the Democrats, it won't stick that we have all these investigations going on. Is it too early, basically, for it to make much of a difference in damaging the Yeah, I mean, we'll see. I mean, if I, were, if I were Biden, I would get, I would try to do what I can to get Menendez off the stage, get him to resign, get him off the, you know, oh, health reasons, and I'm just going to fight, whatever, blah, blah, blah. But Menendez is going to probably want to stick it out and try to fight it because he's that morally corrupt. And if he does stay in office to try to fight it, I actually think that's going to help Trump because Trump can say, look, Biden, he does the, all these lucrative deals for Hunter Biden, 10% to the big guy, getting him an oil executive job in the Ukraine, all this baloney that like it's obvious corruption. And, he, and, and Trump could say, that's what I'm up against. And like Menendez taking you know, bribes from the Egyptian government. I can't be bought. I can't be sold. If Trump leads into that, which was by far his most effective argument in 2016, and it was kind of forgotten about in 2020 because he was actually the president of the United States. He can lean into that again. I think that, yeah, I think that Menendez definitely helps Trump's case uh, to, to make that pitch again. So it, it remains a scene if he'll do it, but it would be highly effective. Which is why I could see Schumer eventually getting him to step down because you just eat the crow now and then you don't have to deal with the ramifications for the larger Democrat party. Well, you can point to the fact that, hey, we told him to step down because we're so balanced exactly, and ethical, right? right? Yeah, and then Trump goes, well, yeah. why don't you tell Biden to step down? That'd be great. So we move on now to the mailbag. Thank you. Someone emailed in. Shout out to Joanna. So jo Joanna wrote in. I'm just going to read it off for you guys. In the Loopcast from September 20th, you mentioned the Edify episode on media. That's a great episode. Go check it out. I had actually watched the episode of Edify before seeing the, the notice for this Loopcast. The first tip to, quote, avoid falling into a media trap is pay attention to headlines and media photos. She warns of photos used for the story. Does the subject look crazy, really angry, or just plain weird? So I opened the loop on Thursday morning to see the picture of the new loop cast and both former President Donald Trump and the interviewer fall under that warning. I had to laugh. Of course, I still listen to the loop cast. All three of you are wonderful. Thanks. Uh, did you purposely use angry, crazy pictures, or were you trying to steer the listener in a certain direction? Question. Thanks. God bless. Joanna from Virginia. Thank you for writing in. 
I felt like this really warranted a more robust response that I could probably give you over email because I think it goes into a lot of our strategy and how we think about different forms of media. So uh, gut reactions off of this email, how would you explain to her you know, the laser eyes we used on the interviewer. Yeah, so the laser eyes, the, the thumbnail, for those of you who didn't see it, the thumbnail is President Trump and then the interviewer. Uh, we we showcased that interview last week on Loopcast. The interviewer, we gave her these like Death Star red laser eyes pointing at Trump. And I really liked this email because it's a great opportunity to talk about different forms of media communication. So the Mary Margaret Olihan Edify video and speaking specifically to reporting, uh, to journalism that is seeking to give the facts that are most pertinent to an event in a balanced way. So she talks about reporting both perspectives on an issue. She talks about, um, like, like she said, uh, the, the headline, the packaging, if you will. Is it trying to sway your opinion or is it just reporting on facts? And what we're doing here at Loopcast is something a little different. Yeah, we do an element of reporting. That's why we put so much research into the stories, because we want to speak about the stories as truthfully as possible. We want to get our facts straight so we're not just shooting off at the hips and like making up statistics like, oh, some politicians do when they're on the stage of a debate. Not that that happened last night at all by any stretch of the imagination. But um, it's a different kind of media product, I guess you would say, that it's much more commentary and op-ed. And I'm actually excited because Mary, I get, I'm working with Mary Margaret on a chapter for a book that's coming up uh, from Catholic Vote, which I'm really excited to share with you more about eventually. But in that, she actually goes into um, how to discern what type of media, what type of news reporting, what type of journalism are you consuming when you're reading a story or listening to a podcast. So I just wanted to make that distinction. Um, but I'm sure, Josh, you have you have your own thoughts on Loopcast yeah, thumbnails, I mean, what we're doing I mean, with I those. I mean, I think the thumbnail was intended to be kind of playful because it seems pretty obvious it was a hostile interview by the NBC News reporter that was coming after Trump. And so, again, it's commentary. Uh, we're just having fun with it. We're not trying to say that the questions are illegitimate. You know, she certainly can ask them. But we do provide analysis, and, and we did in the Loopcast, about what we, why we thought her questions were a little slanted and came with a bias. If I could speak specifically for the loop cast, because that was kind of my, my idea was people look at the loop, they like the aggregation, they like the different things that we say. So I was like, well, we have all these interesting conversations kind of behind the scenes from people who know what they're talking about. I mean, with, with Josh and Erica, both very educated. And so we're like, well, what if we add a little bit more color to what we're already doing with the loop in that we get to add some more opinion, we get to add some more fun things like the mailbag, Twilight Zone, like have a little bit more fun because I think there is a there there is a characteristic of Catholic Vote that I think a lot of people recognize and like that we have some levity. There's a lot of very suit and tie serious news programs out there that are great, but I personally would never watch them for a second. I mean, it'd be funny to think about the Loopcast if we all were wearing suits and ties, especially if Erica was wearing a suit and tie, <laughs> and we were just reading Pulling off Ellen DeGeneres on you there. Exactly, mm -hmm. we were just reading off bullet points of like facts adding no color commentary adding no because that's just not what we're going for here like we're going for something with a little bit of humor a little bit more personality hopefully bring you up a little bit make you laugh you know have that's the podcast format is a little bit different so when i think about those thumbnails we have a lot of fun with those thumbnails because again like we don't need to be so serious about everything with that thumbnail specifically i was like i am intentionally trying to catch people's attention. And then with the headline of did Trump throw the pro-life movement under the bus or did he to say, hey, maybe there was a little bit more to this story that wasn't covered in some of the things that you've seen. Come listen to our research and take on it. And, and we did do a lot of research and we did go deeper than a lot of people did on that because some people just stuck with the gut reaction, but we looked a little bit deeper into it. what did Trump actually say in the interview? When uh, Joanna said I had to laugh, that was the intention. I hope people got a good chuckle out of that. And, and I personally, this is maybe more of a personal philosophy, but if people get too serious about temporal things, especially politics or news events, it can kind of lead to some despair or just being angry all the time. And so I think it's a good kind of reminder to still kind of laugh, to have fun with it, to realize, hey, this isn't our end. You know, that's why I would never, for example, do anything sacrilegious, like with those thumbnails. We actually think about that a lot. Like, is anything here potentially blasphemous or sacrilegious? 
it's much easier to do to politicians because politicians are pretty hilarious and hypocritical. Uh, but when it comes to church subjects, you know, we, we, we want to tread lightly because we would never do that. It's a good reminder that this isn't our end and that you don't need to be really upset about everything all the time to have some fun with it, to have some light with it. Let's try to pair that with some research and hard work from the Loopcast. And we put together hopefully an hour show where you could come, learn something, laugh a little bit, enjoy yourself and be a part of this community in a little bit more of a personal way rather than just reading the headlines in the morning. And I think I love too, that I love working at Catholic Vogue because the office atmosphere is one where people laugh at themselves a lot too. There's a lot of self-deprecation. So it's not like we're just pointing fingers at politicians and like mocking people we disagree with at all. But it is, it's a, it's a levity that also we look at ourselves and recognize that, you know, we make mistakes too. We say ridiculous things too. And so it's, um, I really like what you said there, Tom, about it's a way of helping keep politics at the arm's length, Put it, putting it in their perspective where it really belongs in our lives. So, Well, I laugh at myself because I tell good jokes. Well, yeah. <laughs> jo- well, this is true. And Josh makes fun of me every day. He's, he is so the most I... humble of the humblest of men. <laughs> yeah, he's the humblest for sure. No doubt. So I'm first on the Twilight Zone. This one was kind of a fun one to witness in real time. So this was the Washington Post, um, everyone's favorite. Speaking this is of journalism. You should, exactly. <laughs> so when so the Adify video was brought up, the media trap, like this is the first place I would put under the lens of media trap. They are kind of known for not using the best journalistic practices and being a little bit dirty, sleight of hand, but still kind of being considered the gold standard for journalism for some reason. I don't think many people think that anymore. Well, silver, right? Because New York Times is gold. <laughs> yeah. So- I'm not uh, agreeing gold with jokes. that assessment, but I'm just, <laughs> New York Times is gold, one, gold, and Washington gold Post gold. aspires to be that, but they're number two. <laughs> yeah. I, I thought you were making a Menendez joke. I know. I was I going for heard. gold bars and Mercedes Benz, so it's stuck in there. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so Dave, Dave Portnoy, he's the uh, founder of Barstool Sports. Uh, he is brash. He's from Boston. He says it how it is. Great accent. Great accent. While he does have some redeeming qualities, his whole bro culture is a big thumbs down for Catholics. I just want to get that out there. Yeah, Josh. So you're actually doing the Washington Post right now. So he, he of course, has some. Well, I just want to make sure people understand. You, like, if you go to uh, Dave's website, you know, it's like a lot of scantily yeah. clad babes photos. Like, nah, yeah, I'm I mean, not, this guy's not. I'm not. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna talk about what happened with the Washington Post, but we're not gonna say that Dave is some sort of moral hero. Okay, so just in case our audience right. goes crazy. No, we don't. When when we speak of people, we're not wholesale endorsing everything they do. But right. if we're just looking at this specific uh, situation, so he started a fund uh, during COVID called the Barstool Fund, and they helped give money to small small businesses. A lot of places were pizza places because he has this thing where he goes and he does pizza reviews. They're very popular. They help out the businesses that he goes to often, and so he's become very popular with small business owners because he kept them afloat during COVID when the government shut them down. Yeah, it was awesome. So uh, he started this event. He did this event called the Pizza Fest. It was at, I think, a minor league ballpark in Brooklyn. And pizza places from all over the place were going to come and serve pizza. It's going to be a good time. I know, I kind of I want some pizza, seriously. So he kind of gets word that some... Re- he was getting some of these pizza places were contacting him being like, hey, we have this reporter who's reaching out to us uh, for comment about you. It's like, oh, interesting. And so he got an email that was sent and the, I'm going to say the email before he gets into the, the call, but he says that this Washington Post reporter, Emily Heil, she says, we are planning to write about the festivals and how some of the sponsors have drawn criticism for associating with Dave Portnoy, who has a history of misogynistic comments and problematic behavior. I want to make sure you have a chance to respond to this because you are one of the prominent sponsors at the festival, obviously implying, hey, watch out, we'll put you on blast if you're associated with this guy and we could hurt your reputation. And so he catches wind of this and instantly calls the reporter as soon as he got it and and recorded it. And so his conversation was And told her that she was recording it too. Right, he said, hey, I'm recording this. This is Dave Portnoy. She's like, who are you? He's like, I'm the one you're writing your hit piece about. She's like, oh, hi, how's it going? And uh, she he reads off word for word what this was, but before she denied doing it. She denied sending these emails and then he reads it off. She's like, oh, well, I did. That was one of the more pointed emails. And it was an 11 minute call of just a brutal takedown of you're writing this with an opinion on me and you're trying to scare off sponsors to write a hit piece to defame me. You've already made your mind up. This isn't true reporting. You're not asking for my perspective on the story. It's like, oh, well, we were going to call you tomorrow. 
and he's already had so many of these done to him that it's kind of like second nature. But it was just the it was the most crystal clear distillation of dishonest reporting in real time I've seen probably since the Taylor Taylor of the Wrens lives of TikTok story where she went door to door to her relatives to try to intimidate them. It's kind of crazy. But this kind of the trick is people go around, they try to scare people associated with you, write a hit piece on you, get them to provide comment for them to use as ammo, and then contact you like an hour or two before they write the story. I mean, Brian actually has had this done to him before where they already have their mind made up as to who you are, what you represent, and how you fit into the, the narrative that they want to write about instead of going in with an open mind, listening to all sides, providing context. Washington Post specializes in this. So this isn't even the Twilight Zone, which was, it was very entertaining to watch, by the way. Um, the best part was Washington Post, after Dave Poirier arguably has just as big of a platform in terms of like social reach, everyone saw this. It went everywhere. Everyone was condemning the Washington Post for doing this. They still posted the article after the fact. So Dave was like, hey, you like we I'm happy to talk to you if I can record it. Uh, she's like, oh, let's talk tomorrow at 10. Of course, she cancels. Right. They never talk. R the report comes out on Twitter shameless with the headline. This weekend, New York will host Dave Portnoy's One Bite Pizza Festival. Participating pizzerias have to navigate buzz around the festival and backlash against the Barstool Sports founders controversial remarks and allegations of sexual misconduct. So, um, you know, I've never seen a more brutal ratio, but everyone was like, I cannot believe you actually posted this after you were exposed for exactly what you were doing. It's just crazy. Yeah. But the media knows that this is a very successful tactic. It works well. It reminds me of the local TV station in uh, South Bend, Indiana, that was, you know, there's a, at the time there was this debate whether or not uh, Indiana should, it's 2015, whether or not Indiana should pass a religious freedom restoration act. And Mike Pence was the governor then. And so this TV reporter goes out to this like local pizzeria. I was like, hey, would you support the bill? What about this? If uh, a gay couple wanted to get married and, and they wanted you to cater pizzas for their wedding, what would you do? And this lady is just, she's a Christian. She owns the store. She's like, um, I guess I'd say no. I mean, we're Christian. We, we wouldn't do that or whatever. Then what happens, right? The online mob goes bananas. Uh, Yelp, they had, which is this... You know, you can review different restaurants. There was 7,600 negative reviews on Yelp. Eventually, it was such an avalanche. Like, conservatives are like, well, we got to do something about this. We need, to, we need to do a GoFundMe and help them out. And then GoFundMe backed out and said, you can't do that. So then Glenn Beck just decides to raise money by himself. And it's like the, the left is like, they don't care. They just squashed this little pizzeria like a bug. And eventually they just shut down and it's not even a, a around anymore because it was just like too much to bear. And again, the lesson out of this was like, oh, gosh, that's that's really horrible, isn't it? And the left's like, no, she was a bigot. She was hateful. So that's exactly the thing. Now, Dave Portnoy does, is perfectly fine with gay marriage. He doesn't care. But the reason I bring this up is that Dave knows that the, the media acts like a death star and they do these kind of things where they ruin people's lives and they don't care. All they want to do is advance their agenda. And it's horrible. It's the same thing that happened to Kim Davis, you know, the 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 clerk in Kentucky who didn't want to put her signature on the on a gay marriage license because of cast, of course, Kentucky never voted for a gay marriage. And so all this stuff, like the the left has um, you know, they they always talk about how the right is fascist, but they're the ones, they're totally projecting. They're the ones who are fascists. They use these fascist tactics to try to squash people and to use shame. And when someone stands up and says, actually, I don't think this is the best idea in the world. Well, the, the coolest thing him. about the story with, with Dave is that he has already been through this before. I believe it was Business Insider tried to write another hit piece on some of his like sexual activity, which uh, say what you want about it, it, it whether it happened Again, we're or not. we're not defending it, the guy. It wasn't illegal. Yeah. Not defending, but still, to put this guy's personal life on blast to try to destroy a company is like pretty low from their... their reporting standards and so he's basically at the point where like these people are evil and i'm going to call out their tactics and i'm not going to back down the cool thing is is like he has a big enough platform and i think a lot of people do so that this can't really hurt them if anything it kind right. of makes them stronger well, because everyone's sees when it's exposed you and know it makes them more popular and hugh hefner now he's dead but he was a misogynist and he was you know a, a playboy you know he, he had numerous horrible you know th things in his past 
But since he was a, a member of the left and he donated all the causes, he was protected. But because Dave Portnoy doesn't play ball with the left-wing causes, they attack him. If Dave Portnoy got religious, quote-unquote, for the left and suddenly donated hundreds of thousands of dollars to BLM, they'd leave him alone. In fact, they'd write glowing pieces about him. No WAPO calls from the reporters. Right. Yeah. They wouldn't threaten no. local businesses that wanted to work with him. Erica. Your All right. Well, I like to keep my eye on the ivory tower because while we can make fun of academics, their ideas do have consequences. So this week, the American Anthropological Association, together with the Canadian Anthropology Society, they're having their big conference. Uh, it reaches into a lot of dis disciplines, so it'll affect people in the hard sciences, psychology, neuroscience, biology. It affects people in the ph philosophical uh, bent of things. So it's a, it, this is an important conference. They canceled the panel entitled, Let's Talk About Sex, Baby, Why Biological Sex Remains a Necessary Analytic Category in Anthropology. And the idea was that they're going to have these panelists come on and explain why considering questions of male and female and sexual reproduction gives us insight into historical questions and anthropological questions. One might say, duh. The cancellation came, and the, the letter is just, I mean, it's priceless. But the decision, they said, this is the Anthropological Association of Canada and America, the decision, our decision was based on extensive consultation and was reached in the spirit of respect for our values, the safety and dignity of our members, and the scientific integrity of the program. So having a panel on reproduction on sex and how it affects our understanding of the human person would threaten scientific integrity. And then the real reason, and this is not what they said, but it's actually the real reason, the reason the session deserved further scrutiny was that the ideas were advanced in such a way as to cause harm to members represented by the trans and LGBTQI of the anthropological community, as well as mm. the community at large, meaning all of academia. So now it's, there's basically thinking about biological sex, which I don't like saying that. Riley Gaines, shout out. We should not be saying biological sex. There's male and there's female. There's not like biological woman and biological male. We're just male and female. True. But that considering these questions threatens science. I loved the fact that the panelists actually came back. Normally what you see in academia is Everyone sort of like bows down and apologizes and says, oh, please don't fire me. I'm sorry. Like, I need more re-education, I guess, from Canada or something. Um, but they came back and they said the decision to anathematize our panel is very much an anti-science response to a politicized lobbying campaign. So even among academics, we're starting to see some pushback on this. All the panelists unanimously pushed back against the wow. big conference in the society. They called it a profound betrayal of our society's commitment to advancing human understanding and applying this understanding to the world's most pressing problems. They said Looks like that- like they uncovered a spine. Exactly, there was- a... <laughs> Josh, that was really funny. Get it, anthropology? Do we need to explain that joke too? What do you think, Pogo? We're good? All right. <laughs> oh, we're good. So we're good. here's to yeah. finding a spine in the anthropological societies. Thank you, Mercy. You get a gold star. <laughs> gold bar. Right now. Gold's the color of the show today. Woo! It, it's, I've, I, I was reading something, too, about science and the danger of thinking of science as untouchable and cemented, because, and, and how odd that actually is to real scientists, because I was reading something about someone that studies like molecular biology, and when they do tests on things, they literally test the assumptions every day. Mm -hmm. Like something changes almost daily about something they discover or, oh, we thought about this wrong, let's adjust. So it's so odd and anti-science to not hear the perspectives here because science is supposed to be this big body of continued learning. And it's, we're just, just seeing such an obvious rejection of that. Yeah, so you can't ask these questions. Example. Yeah, I remember when I was in a graduate program it was already starting because I would bring up, you know, some question about Aquinas or something. And someone would say, well, you can't ask that. That's a non-question. I remember just sitting there like, wait, are we supposed to be like, he was. Wait, what's a non-question? A non-question. And obviously the questions of what is a, sex what are non-question. A non-question. Non Sorry, I'm confused. Okay. A non-question 
is just it's positing a challenge to something that's accepted in a way that you're just not allowed to say it like it's not allowed it doesn't there is no answer to it therefore you can't ask it sometimes but it's it's just a way of academics in a very fancy way saying shut up and sit down we don't want to talk about yeah, it that. sounds very 1984 yeah yeah it was very uh 2004 no interesting um josh you're up so um last year 18 year old uh kayla ellingson got into a heated argument with a 42 year old man named shannon brant and it got political um a political argument i should say the 18 year old kayla was this conservative and Shannon Brandt is this uh, liberal, and they just were going at it and they arguing back and forth. Eventually, Shannon Brandt gets in his SUV and runs over the 18-year-old and kills him. It started out as a political argument. Uh, Shannon uh, Brandt is now uh, sent, got sentenced to uh, five years in state prison for this. Now, Here's what I want to help people understand. We have another circumstance, another crime, right, that was committed. Jonathan Darnell, Gene uh, Marshall, and Joan, uh, Joan Bell um, were inside of an abortion facility to try to prevent abortions from happening in Washington, D.C. This is the, the abortion facility in Washington, D.C. that had done horrible things. Mary Margaret Olihan's the journalist has been exposing all the things that they've done illegally in this facility. So these three people were in there, to, tr which is obviously a violation of the, the, the law, the FACE Act, the Freedom of Access to Clinic Entrances. But they did this, I think, to try to highlight, like, there's a lot of criminal activity going on at this abortion facility, and no one's doing anything about it. Um, we're talking about a couple of grandmas, 73 years old, 74 years old. They're facing up to 10 years in prison. So just ask yourself, a 73-year-old grandma could spend 10 years in jail for blocking an abortion facility from conducting their business, which is, of course, to kill babies. And we have a guy in North Dakota who murders an 18-year-old conservative with his Ford Explorer, and he's going to get five years in prison. Now, does that make sense to anybody? What was the, what was the charge against... The forty-two-year-old was it? Wasn't what degree murder was it? Was it even murder? Was it manslaughter? He pled guilty to manslaughter. Yeah, manslaughter. So it wasn't even. So murder. it wasn't even. Yeah. Huh. Unbelievable. I mean, wow. You know, it's not like he punched the guy, at, you know, in a big fight, and then it, it happened to be a fatal blow. You ran someone over with your SUV. Right. You had to like get in, turn it on, aim it, and kick the gas, like. It's yeah, pretty it's, cold there's a lot of meditation yeah. there, even yeah. if it's in the spur of the moment. So The Face Act prosecutions are super disturbing. I mean, in, in addition to the grandmas facing, I think it's 11 years if they're, if they're sentenced to the full extent of the law. Um, yes, 11 years. Yeah. So there's said, also the 10, group. Yeah. yeah, there's also a group that were convicted. They, they were found guilty uh, back in August. This is with Lauren Handy, uh, who was the one who found the five bodies of the near-term babies and, and took them uh, from the, the garbage man, essentially. It's just, it's horrible. Um, but they've actually been held in prison awaiting sentencing, which is something that's reserved for violent criminals, usually. And all of her appeals to be able to go home before the sentencing uh, have been yep. denied so far. We're on the third denial, I believe, this just week. Just like Mark Hawk, you know, he, yeah. they thought he violated the law by shoving a guy which is more quote, more quote violent, obviously not. It was self defense, and they mm -hmm. and they wanted to have him held too. It's like what is the what is the problem here? But no. it, it, the Biden administration it's intimidation. Is, yeah, yeah, the Biden administration is so pro abortion, and they're like going fanatical on on these face act quote violations, like absolutely throwing the book at people. Yet they have the southern border wide open. Is uh is there any path to potentially getting the Face Act repealed? There are efforts every couple I of years. I doubt it. You'll see it, but yeah, it's unlikely. What would unlikely. what would you need to happen in order to make that happen? I mean, you're not going to get. I don't think you're going to get sixty senators anytime in the near future to go along with that. 
the I mean they would filibuster anything. The, the the FACE Act got, that was one of Bill Clinton's priorities, and it was after a decade of pro-lifers having, I would say, effective civil disobedience by chaining themselves to abortion facilities. Incidents, right? Nonviolent All protest. that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, and, and to me, the fact that they passed the FACE Act to stop that showed me that it was effective. But now, because the FACE Act is in there, and you could face 10 or 11 years in jail, um, yeah, I, I would not caution... I would not recommend, obviously, people to, to do this. These three people decided to do it in with D.C. because they felt it, it just had to get this exposed, how much uh, lawlessness was going on at this D.C. facility. But, um, you know, I, I'm not, I don't want to, don't take this lightly. I mean, look at what this Justice Department is doing. Yeah, seriously. Well, uh, if you thought this episode was golden, uh, you can leave us a review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, uh, and follow us on YouTube. Uh, like the episode. Appreciate all that. Tell your I friends mean, about it. Share really it. Want it. Mm-hmm. Share it. Give us a gold star. Uh, give us five gold stars if you can. Um, we uh, might be moving this podcast to Egypt. We'll see <laughs> if we can keep this going under current circumstances in America. But uh, thank you all so much for listening. Uh, hopefully our takes uh, late at night were... Excellent. Uh, we'll see in the time warp here. But yeah, we appreciate you all so much. Thank you for emailing in. If you want to email in more mailbag questions, loopcast at catholicvote.org. We like listening to those and we will read some of the best ones on the podcast. But until next time, Our Lady Guadalupe, St. Fidelis, St. Thomas More, pray for us. And we'll see you on the next one. Bye, guys.